This is our panel on the first year experience, uh, th surviving and thriving in the first year. And for many of you, if you have students who are first years right now, which I assume you may, you um, probably heard Steve and me, Steve Tolman and me, um, talk with you a little bit on move-in day about what things might be like for a student in her first year. And so what we want to do today is, is sort of build on that now that we're uh, halfway through the semester and uh, you have seen firsthand, heard firsthand, maybe read by text firsthand uh, what the students are going through. Um, we thought it might be helpful to put things in kind of context. Um, so in some ways, the first year students have gotten through some of the biggest, uh, most obvious transitions, right? They've settled in, they, they know how to get through the tunnels at Barnard, they know the schedule of the dining hall, they know um, which libraries are better for them to study in and which libraries are better for them to socialize in. Um, they know the campus pretty well now, they know the neighborhood pretty well now. Some of them have gotten out and started to get to know the city. Um, some of them are telling me the restaurants I should be going to eat at, which is always <laughs> nice. Um, they're pretty much settled into their classes in the sense that, you know, they, they certainly know what classes they're taking. Um, right now, it's a little unsettling because they've been in the middle of midterms. Um, but I, I think it's safe to say that at this time of the semester, the newness has worn off, that excitement of the first couple of weeks of figuring everything out, and there's sort of this sense of reality settling in. Um, you know, it's really, really settling in that it's up to them to manage their schedules, it's up to them to get their work done in a timely manner, it's up to them to manage their relationships and to ask for help if they need it. And they're beginning to understand how different it is to handle those challenges on their own, not just during the day, but also continuing into the evening when they don't necessarily go home to their family and what's familiar, but they go back to the residence halls where they're continuing to get to know people and build relationships. And so this part of the process that they're in is a whole different sort of transition from those first weeks, and it's not close to ending. It's still going on. Um, so I've met with a lot of first year students through these first two months of the semester and I've talked with a lot of them one on one and the conversations can run the gamut. I talk to some students who say I love my classes, I love my roommates, I love the food here, I love Barnard and of course I love hearing that. It's always great to know that um, it, this place is really striking a chord and I'm often really struck by um, the really visceral reaction that so many students have to Barnard. They, they sense that this is the right place for them as soon as they step on campus and I love talking with students who feel that all the way through these first few months. That kind of enthusiasm can really um, help carry students through uh, a stressful time like this at midterms. But I do also talk with students who aren't quite as sure about how they feel. Some students are still homesick. Some students are still looking for the right group of friends. Some students are still trying to figure out what their professors want from them in their classes. So some of you may have gotten phone calls or emails or texts that say something like, Everyone in my class is smarter than I am. Uh, everybody here studies all the time. Nobody here studies. Um, uh, my professor is harder than everyone else's professors. Um, there's no one here for me to hang out with. And these are uh, these can be common feelings and experiences during these first couple of months. A number of students experience them, but many of them don't realize that other members of their class, other people in their hallway, other first years may be feeling the same things. So I just want to offer a few ob observations. Um, about what they may be saying, what you may be hearing from them. And these will echo a little bit of what, of what I might have said in the um, remarks I made during orientation. If, considering how smart and accomplished all of these students are, these students who were likely straight A students in high school, who were in the top 10% of their classes, were given awards and scholarships and praise all the time, it can be something of a shock to find themselves to be one of many, many really smart and accomplished women. And they may not be getting A's so easily in their courses, and it may be unsettling for them to feel really challenged in their courses. And their professors are challenging them in very, very deliberate ways in order to push them to understand more complex and nuanced concepts and develop more sophisticated, excuse me, sophisticated ways of expressing themselves. So even a student who was already an astute reader or a very strong writer is being asked to redraft her essays and to work on her ideas more and to improve them and to refine them. And this can feel very, very frustrating to students who are used to getting top grades on their first drafts, on their first efforts. Some students are also still struggling with the idea that the work habits that got them through high school so successfully aren't really the right ones to be successful here in college. Um, the readings assignments may be more dense or more voluminous than they're used to. They may require more time and more care. 
Um, the writing assignments they get are often asking them to be much more specific than they're used to. Um, they may have one mi midterm this week and two midterms next week. They may have four midterms in one week or several papers due at one time. And in some cases, the students who came into my office the first week or two of classes saying, why can't I take five classes? Why can't I take six classes? Are now coming back and saying, do I have to take five classes next semester? Can I still just take four? Um, so, and believe it or not, it is actually time for them almost to start thinking about what they will take next semester. We do ask them to make an advanced plan for the following semester. Um, so next week I will be holding meetings for the entire first year class to um, give them a preview of what it will be like to plan out their spring semester, uh, what the procedures will be, what the deadlines will be, and um, instructing them on how to find information, something along the lines of what I did in the summer, except then it will become their responsibility to meet with their advisors, to choose classes, to go through the enrollment process, to reserve spaces in those classes, and they'll be doing that throughout the month of November. So, and then just as they had the opportunity at the beginning of this semester to make changes if they wanted to, they'll be able to next January consider the plan they put together and make changes. So once again, this is hopefully meant to make it a step-by-step, -step, very thoughtful process of planning out uh, a spring program, but it can create a little bit more anxiety than we'd like as students try to get used to this idea of thinking about next semester at the same time they're still trying to handle this semester. And so um, just something to know that they'll be uh, perhaps a little bewildered by that as they go through it for this first time. So please, please encourage them if they tell you that they're anxious about thinking about classes for next semester to talk to their advisors uh, regularly, to talk to me if they're nervous about next semester and certainly if they're nervous about this semester. Um, all of us who work with for your students talk to one another regularly. We try to identify students who may need some encouragement or advice, but it's not uncommon for Barnard students to feel like they need to put a good face on everything, um, particularly around their professors or their deans. And so we may not always realize that somebody could use some help or some advice or some support. And so one of the important lessons we really want students to realize, especially at this stressful time of the semester during midterms, is that it is okay to ask for help, whether it's academic help, whether it's personal help, and that we don't see that as some kind of weakness. We see it as a sign of maturity and intelligence. Um, so having said all of this, I do also want to let you know that it's not all high anxiety here on campus. Um, I do <laughs> actually I hear about activities that students are involved in. I do see them between classes. I see some of them at events in the evening and the singers are singing and the politicians have been running for office and the dancers are dancing and the activists are activating and it's um, and everyone is showing up anywhere there's free food and so there is a lot there are a lot of moments of excitement and happiness um, going on around campus and I know that there are many more going on in the hallways that I don't even get a chance to see as much that we'll talk about and through all of these moments whether they are these happy and exciting ones or whether they are some of the more um, stressful and uncertain ones they're learning the ropes you know they are figuring out Barner they're discovering what they think is important for them to get out of this place. And as I tell all of the students, each one of them is on her own timeline and she is figuring out where she fits into this community and uh, this university and this city. And she is going to start to feel at home as time goes on. So what we want to do with the rest of today's panel is to talk about some of the experiences that all first year students for the most part are sharing. Um, and we wanted to talk about the two main aspects. The vast majority of our students do live on campus and so there are uh, many, many of the students who are experiencing living in the first year area of the residence halls together. And then also there are classes that every first year student must take this year, first year English and first year seminar, which are designed specifically for new Barnard students. So we want to talk about them, um, but instead of me describing to you what the experience is like based on my uh, discussions with students, or, or with Steve Tolman describing to you what the students' uh, experience in the residence halls are, we have asked some students here who have a very special perspective on these things because they are upper class students students, juniors and seniors here at Barnard who have survived their first year here and thrived 
And they are also all RAs in the residence hall. They are either currently RAs on a first year floor or they have been RAs on a first year floor. And so they not only have the experience of going through first year, taking these classes we're talking about, living in the first year areas of the residence hall, but also then working with other first year students as, as they've gone through it. So they have a really interesting set of experiences to reflect on and share with us today. So I'm going to turn things over to Steve Tolman so that we can all talk about the residence aspect first. Great. So before I turn over the panel to the experts, also known as the RAs next to me, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of some of the things that are taking place in the residence halls. Um, so far we've had over 75 programs taking place in the residence halls and it's only the middle of October. Um, these are opportunities for your students to get involved, meet others, um, and have fun or learn something new. Some examples are a Pilates program, a block party amongst several floors, movie nights, pumpkin carving, no fingers were lost. Um, and floor dinners and things like that. Um, and then today you'll also see that there's a large event going on um, called the Quad Event, the Fall Fest. And so it's an opportunity for all the thousand students that live in the Quad to come together if they have family members to bring some of their family members with them and have a good time. Um, every night, um, on top of those 75 programs, that Monday through Thursday for an hour, we have an RE that sits in the lobby of the building there to interact with students and do a small fun community builder with them. And so it's an opportunity if your student wants to pop by and then do something fun real quickly, or if she wants to have a, an opportunity to chat with an RE, she always knows there's an RE sitting in the lobby for an hour Monday through Thursday from 8 to 9 o'clock. Um, our eco reps, um, they do a wonderful job. They are 10 students that work with our first years to um, reduce our carbon footprint. And then the eco reps have done an amazing job so far. Um, they have a monthly potluck dinner. And then they send an email out um, to all the first year students inviting them to come to this potluck dinner. And the potluck dinners always have a, a theme um, for a different environmental issue each month. And then one of my favorite programs I do every year, they um, just did, it's called Parking Day. And this is something that's actually done across the country, so you may have heard about it before. But it's an opportunity for students in urban environments to take back some of the parking spaces in that city and then to use it for a community space. So in front of the college, they took over a couple parking spots and then they used that as a social place for the day and had students come out and be able to relax and put some blankets down and then use that as a, a fun space rather than a space to be occupied by a car. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, and then lastly is one of the things they have coming up is called a green certification program. And so they're given an opportunity to all of the students in the buildings to commit to being environmentally friendly and reducing their carbon footprint. And they're going to have a list of things that they're going to ask every student on this list of 20 things to pick five or six things that you can commit to doing. Um, and so your students will get that information soon. Um, and then lastly is that our campus is a, a, a happening place in terms of things that are happening on campus. And if your student ever tells you there's nothing to do on the weekend or there's nothing to do during the week that she's bored, then she's not looking at all the colorful posters that she'll see on all of the bulletin boards and all of the walls um, posted throughout the campus. In addition to everything that's taking place in the residence halls, um, there's a lot of the great things that happen on campus. And then just a few things to point out is the big sub just happened recently. And that's essentially what it is, is a big sub. Uh, we have a sub that goes from one side of the campus to the other and our students come out and enjoy some fresh food. Uh, there's also Broadway tickets. The students are always going to Broadway shows. Uh, there's been numerous great speakers and guest lecturers. Uh, student clubs and organizations are in full swing and there was recently a club fair to where students were able to come meet all the different clubs and organizations and get contact information of how to join those clubs. So those are some of the things that are happening in terms of programs and events on campus. Um, Dean Hallball did a wonderful job of articulating uh, where your students are at at this time in the year. From my perspective in the residence halls, they've all sort of settled in. They've gotten used to their roommate. They've adjusted um, for the most part. Uh, the month of October tends to be a really, um, a relatively quiet month for our students in the residence halls. They've found their groove both academically, socially, and with all their clubs and uh, extracurricular activities. Uh, the one thing that's a big stressor for this, them this time of year is uh, midterms. And midterms for me are, is a funny term because I think of a specific time, a week that midterms happen, but it seems like the entire month of October for our students is midterms. And you can see the experts next to me nodding their head in agreement. <laughs> 
Um, and so lastly is one thing that's amazing about the fall semester is the month of October seems to be kind of a slower month. It's a little low key. Um, but then once we hit the month of November, the semester really seems to fly by. Your students will have off a few days for fall break and then it's only a couple weeks between fall break and Thanksgiving break. They come back from Thanksgiving break and then they're already in the month of December and they're getting ready for exams and before you know it, it's just time to go home for winter break. Um, so the, the fall semester will wrap up pretty quickly once we hit November. And then the last thing I just want to mention is that you all should have received a first year focus parent newsletter from me um, a few weeks ago. Um, and so what I try to do is two to three times a semester to email all the parents. Um, just a newsletter. And that newsletter has really all of the important information that your daughter needs to know. And so hopefully you'll be able to read through that newsletter and be able to have good conversations with her about it. If you didn't receive that newsletter, you can come up afterwards and let me know. Um, the way I get your email address is when your daughter submitted her housing application she would have listed your email address on there. So without much further ado, I want to be able to give our panelists some the opportunity to really share their experiences with you. Um, and Steve, I'm sorry, I had completely, in my rush to get things started, um, I wanted to pause and actually have all of our panelists introduce themselves, um, just so that I think you, you could see their names, I hope, on the cards. But if I could ask each of the RAs who say who you are, where you're from, um, what year you are, what major you have, since you've all declared, and where you're an RA, and if you're not on a first year floor, where you were when you were a first year focus RA. <laughs> Uh, so I guess I'll start. Hi everyone, my name is Margarita Borovka. I'm a senior here at Barnard. I am pre-med and a biology major. I'm from Staten Island, New York, and uh, this is my third year as an FYF RA. I think that's, yeah. Which floor? Um, cell seven. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is Boyan Park, and I'm an international student from South Korea. I'm currently a junior, majoring in political science and minoring in economics. Um, I'm not an FYF RA this year. I'm living in 600 with upperclassmen, but I've been an FYA RA last year, and I was on Solve Read 3. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Georgia. Um, I'm a senior art history major. I'm from Houston, Texas. Um, I was an FYF RA um, my sophomore year on Brooks 5. I'm currently an RA for senior experience um, in Salt's Tower. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brittany Wilson. I'm a junior here. My major is environmental science. My minor is Africana studies. And I'm also pre-med. Um, this year, I'm an RA in three Salt's. And is that all the questions? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. So our first question for the panel today is, what was it like for you as a first year student to move into the residence halls and get used to living with your roommates and your hallmates? What were some of the challenges and how were those challenges resolved? And lastly, what were some of the things you did, such as social plans, conversations with your roommates that helped you establish a stronger relationship throughout the year? So I remember my first year, I was in a trip on Sauls. I was the last one to move in <clears throat> and when I came in, there were boxes everywhere, clothes everywhere, and I was just like, this room is so small. Like, how are three girls going to live here? So I was like really sad and upset at first, but um, eventually we cleaned the room up, we decorated it, and it was beautiful. And um, all three of my roommates, we happened to be pre-med as well, and um, that was like a way that we all connected. We took gen chem together, we took organic chemistry together, and like our social events, we'll be studying every single night together, but um, <laughs> to this day, we're still best friends. We um, went to Florida together this summer, and those are like my closest friends at Barnard. Now, although it may all sound good right now, at one point we did have a conflict. It was around the time of midterms. We all had a Gen Chem midterm coming up, and we were all really stressed and upset. And um, one of my roommates, she wanted to study, and the other roommate wanted to watch a movie. And I, too, wanted to study as well. And my roommate, who wanted to watch a movie, she was using headphones, but she laughed a lot, and it was really loud and annoying at times. And she was just like, well, I'm trying to um, like relax. I'm really stressed out. And we were all just like, well, we all agreed that our room would be a study space first before it was for entertainment. And um, we um, asked our RA to mediate us, and things got better, and it worked out from there. And to this day, we're all great friends. And I'd like to think like the roommate agreement contract that we all have to fill out in the beginning of the year as like why we stayed so closely, because we all agreed for our room to be clean. We all agreed that we were gonna study first and play later, and we all agreed that if we wanted to have male visitors to come over, they couldn't sleep over. 
So because of those agreements, we stayed friends. Great. Um, I'm going to talk about my experience. Uh, my roommate and I, we got along very well at the very beginning of the year, but we definitely had to adjust to each other. She's from a very small town upstate New York. I'm from Seoul, South Korea, and I grew up in Paris. So we definitely had like cultural differences and then background differences. So one anecdote that really portrays our experience was the first roommate dinner that we had during orientation. We all went to Tom's because it's supposed to be the hot place here. Um, and and we got hamburgers, and um, the way I was taught uh, while I was growing in France, and it might sound like really silly to you right now, but you use your knife and fork to cut your hamburger to eat it in a civilized manner. Um, so because I wanted to impress my roommate and because I've been taught that way, I started using my fork and knife to eat my hamburger and my fries. She looked at me saying, where are you from? Why do you eat that way? <laughs> so I explained her, oh, that's how I've been taught, but apparently you don't do this here. So she told me, put that down. We're just going to use our fingers, and that's totally OK. So that was something, that, and that became a theme throughout our experience together. We almost spent every single night together, um, and we talked about the cultural differences and how you know different it is. but. Amazing is it, it is, and we learn how to respect each other. However, midterms and the month of October came, and that was a very stressful period for both of us. We had a lot of work, um, and we had really different studying styles. Uh, she would stay in her room, I would go to the library, so I would be there for like more than 10 hours, and um, she was just really worried about me and, and she didn't know where I was and we didn't have our nights at Tom's anymore and so you know issues like printing, lighting, um, I would stay up very late, she would go to bed at 12. So those issues came up and um, I didn't really recognize those tensions until a friend of us told us that she was really upset about a lot of things. So basically before talking to my RA, I suggested that we would have an open conversation about this. And I, was, I told her, you know, we've been coping very well and like adjusting to each other, like just have a really frank, open conversation about this. And she started telling me what she was frustrated about. And throughout that conversation, it was like the, one of the most fruitful conversations that I've ever had in my life. We, she started crying, but we cried together and, and we shared the pain about going through midterms. and. Um, Actually, that became a very good habit. We always had very open conversations every single time, and I felt more comfortable in my room because I knew that whatever I was doing right now was OK with her. And she would tell me if she had a problem with it. Um, so when I was a first year, I lived in a triple on cell six. And for me, this was particularly difficult because I'm an only child, and I felt that um, even as prepared as I thought I was for college and you know, as not spoiled as I thought that I was, I realized that I had a lot of serious growing to do. Um, some things that, uh, in retrospect, that I did, and I, today I can't believe that I did them, you know, I would lie in my bed, which was um, a bunk bed, and I had to sleep on the top bunk, which for me was very unfamiliar. Um, you know, in, at home I had my own bed, uh, I had all the privacy that I wanted, but I remember that I would lie in my bed at night and talk on the phone, and I would get so angry that my roommate would tell me to go outside into the hallway. Uh, um, I know that some of the other conflicts we had in our room were just about things like turning off the lights, um, not slamming the door, and I think that something we did some, mm, I think that something we're sort of at fault for is for not having good communication. We were incredibly passive aggressive. Um, when, we, when somebody left um, some form of garbage on the floor, nobody would say anything. People would just sort of move it around until somebody wound up throwing it out. And these things uh, accumulated. And um, we found that there was a lot of tension in the room. For us, unfortunately, we didn't have any open conversations. It's just that with time, things sort of um, uh, things sort of got better. We just got used to living together. But uh, that's something that I think is important today when I talk with my residents. Um, 
and I encourage them to really look at their roommate contract and at the communication section specifically uh, and to take it very seriously uh, because it can help avoid a lot of problems in the future. Um, I was in a souls double um, and like Margarita I'm an only child as well so um, I was very nervous about the notion of sharing a space with somebody pretty much all the time sleeping in the same room as someone was just so such a foreign notion to me um, but my roommate was also an only child and we actually had a pretty easy time getting along um, I think it's because we were both so nervous about upsetting the other person that we were like hyper aware of you know like but once the lights were out, the lights were out. You would have to kind of like navigate the room with the lights off. You wouldn't, you couldn't even use your cell phone pretty much. Um, so it was surprisingly easy um, my first semester. Um, the roommate contract was, I mean, we were both on the same page in, in that regard, so that was wonderful. Um, and as far as the, the entire floor goes, we were, I pretty much have my core friends are from my, my freshman year floor. Um, so I had a really great first um, semester, but as the second semester came around, <clears throat> my roommate actually became kind of dissatisfied with Barnard. Um, pretty much between January and March, she was really considering transferring. Um, and that became a unique challenge, kind of grappling with her um, dissatisfaction, trying to I mean, it was honestly really difficult to hear how much she didn't like Barnard, to hear her complaining about, you know, the social aspects, to hear her complaining about the relationship with Columbia, to hear her talking about, you know, the academic challenges. Um, and it kind of, like, wore me down, honestly. And um, I definitely utilized my RA to kind of figure out how to address those issues because I wanted to be there for her. We were friends. Um, but it did, it definitely took a toll on me as well. So. Um, but I think through conversations I had with my RA, I learned how to um, kind of gear our conversations to more personal matters and not to kind of universalizing the experience at Barnard um, to kind of talk about like her particular issues, why she's having a difficult time. Um, and I think she, she ultimately ended up transferring. I think she had a difficult time with um, New York. She came from a small town in Massachusetts. She ended up at Vassar. She's very happy there. Um, so I think that we, we learned to gear our conversations to her personal issues instead of kind of a universal experience of, of Barnard. Um, and as far as um, little, you know, conflicts that arose, like when, I, when we had our conversation about, you know, prepping for this panel, I, I had a really hard time, like, recalling those, those roommate conflicts. Um, so, I mean, also, I mean, at the time, I'm sure that, you know, I remember now the heat was a huge issue. I like sleeping in a sauna, and she really likes sleeping like it's the Arctic. So there was that. So, but in retrospect, they seem like such small issues. And um, learning to live with somebody is a huge life skill. And I'm really, I mean, I lived with someone my junior year, and I realized how much I learned how to um, deal with multiple, like, lifestyles. Um, so, yeah. Great. All right, our second question is, as a first year student, how did you interact with your RA? Were there particular conversations that you had with her that were helpful to you then? And then were there programs that she offered that you still remember in particular? Um, so I uh, found a lot of support uh, in my RA in terms of my academic experiences here, but also in terms of uh, my personal life. Um, my RA was also pre-med like me, and she was just so supportive about um, the challenges that I was going through, um, taking intro bio and in the intro bio labs or taking chemistry. Um, even as I went on through my uh, remaining years here at Barnard, I always found her um, to be very helpful uh, with anything on an academic level. Um, uh, on a personal note, um, I went home very, very frequently on the weekends, especially during my first semester. Um, it was just more comfortable for me. Uh, I knew everyone there. Um, and also, I, I was in a relationship. Uh, however, when that relationship ended during the second semester, I found that I literally had no friends. And I was very behind in, this, uh, in the social circles of Barnard. I felt very left out and emotionally drained. 
And when I came to my RA, I don't know uh, what she did. I don't think she did anything. She just listened to me. And in some sort of way, I felt much better. And eventually over time, yes, I made friends. I made a lot of friends. Um, but uh, my RA was very, very important for me um, in, those, um, in those aspects specifically. I had a quite different experience. Um, rather than the RA programs, we built up um, our community around classes because we were in residence seminars, so we took a seminar course together. Um, um, it was really nice to have classmates living with you because we could organize study groups together, um, talk about the professor, um, and basically also the individual um, meetings that we would have with the professor would become a discussion for the entire group. Um, and besides the um, common classroom um, community that we had, we also really focused on the individuals. When our friends would have a show, for example, the varsity show, we would all go together and, and build up community that way. Um, I, uh, I guess I had a challenge with um, from a relationship with my RA at first, because I, did, I kind of saw her as more someone who was enforcing the rules. But um, I think I was, I was in my friend's room kind of lamenting about my Italian class and how difficult it was. To, the dynamic of the class was really challenging to me. Um, and my RA just kind of happened to walk in and, um, and like heard all these issues. And she was like, oh, yeah, I've, I've totally had that problem. Like, let's talk about it. Let, let me help you. Like, figure out how to address this issue. And it ended up being a really great conversation. And so I continued to go to her with like specific problems that I was having, specific challenges, be them academic, be them social, like extracurricular. Um, and she would always find some way to um, like listen, come up with some kind of solution. Um, I mean, you can't always have a solution to a problem. but. So I could always come to her with specific issues, or I mean, we would go to Hewitt late night, Hewitt together all the time. So, um, and actually, my RA ended up is now my best friend. So, it ended up being a really great relationship. So my first year, I was the hardcore pre-med student. All I did was study. I would go to Butler right after class, 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. Not even exaggerating. I'd be in Butler doing chemistry problem sets, calculus problems. So I never went to any programs. And like looking back at my first year, I really wish that I had gone to more of my RA programs, especially because I'm an RA now, and I see how much of a community I'm building on my floor amongst my residents. So like, advise your children to please go to the RA programs. They're a great way to meet people and to make lifelong friends. And I wish I had done it my first year. Great. All right, our next question is, as an FYF RA, what kind of challenges have you seen amongst the first year students on your hallways? And how have you helped them with these challenges? So I've been lucky. My first two years as an RA, I've had an amazing floor. <clears throat> Last year, I was in um, the fourth floor of Brooks. And throughout the whole year, I only had one small roommate conflict. And it was over um, just not closing the door quietly, turning lights on at nighttime, like small issues of respect that I think like you forget about throughout the year. And the resident, she would come to me, and I would ask her, like, do you want me to talk to the roommate, or would you prefer to speak to your roommate on your own? And I will always encourage her to speak to the roommate on her own because like, I think it's important for them to communicate amongst each other. And eventually she kept saying, like, no, it's fine. Like, I just wanted to keep you up to date, but like, it's OK. And um, after a while, she started to get sick because she wasn't able to sleep at night. Her roommate was being loud. And it became like a bigger issue. So I told her, like, as like, an IRA, I'm going to have to step in. Either I go talk to the roommate, or you discuss with her, and you come back to me with some updates. So. They wound up having a discussion, and she came back to me and told me that like her roommate still wasn't really um, listening to her. So I met with the roommate um, on my own, and she basically like apologized. And from there, like things became better somehow. I think they kind of worked it out amongst each other. But that was my only conflict that I ever had on my floor, and I was really grateful about that. Um, so um, this is my third year as an RA, and. Uh, throughout the years, I've seen that, that there have been sort of some commonalities among some of the residents that I've had. And in particular, um, I found that a lot of first years, including myself back when I was a first year, um, are afraid to acknowledge the feelings that they have. Uh, they can feel uh, homesick. They can just feel sad. 
but they often won't talk to anybody about it because when they go to their classes or when they're walking around campus, everybody looks so busy, Every um, people are always on their cell phone, everybody's got something to do, everybody's going somewhere. And uh, I feel that it's difficult to sort of stop and say, it's okay um, to feel that way. I'm probably not the only one that feels that way. And um, to acknowledge those feelings incrementally as they come up and to avoid um, bottling up of emotions. Um, and on my hall, on my halls, uh, something that I do is just casually talk to residents frequently um, just to see how their day is going. And uh, often, I don't have to say much. They're just willing to, to share with me. Um, and so yeah, I just want to acknowledge the importance of really um, not being afraid to uh, to talk to others about the way you're feeling, your RA, your roommates, whoever it may be. Okay. Um, the first year students may be confused about the Columbia Barnard relationship, and that's something that I had to address as an RA. Um, the tension may come from, like, because you had ex an experience that was directly related to that subject, or because you've had heard from friends about those tensions. Um, what I, the way I approach this is that, as a, as a junior now, I can definitely say that those tensions totally fade away. So for example, I can give you a few anecdotes. I'm actually currently living with um, two Columbia students in my suite. So that really shows that they really feel integrated. Um, before I lived with um, Columbia students, a student came up to me and said, <clears throat> I think, well, well, while I was trying to get her into my room, um, she was saying, well, I think it's ridiculous that we have to sign in as guests when we go to the same school. Um, another Example would be, um, during my first year, my friend would send me email through my at barnard.edu email. Now, when I just gave her my uni, she for completely forgets that I'm using my Barnard email address and would sometimes email me to my Columbia email address. So I had to ask her to actually send all those emails to my Barnard address. Um, and also, a quote that I really remember from um, from my sophomore year was um, a Columbia student, a male student, um, was actually telling me how he feels that Columbia invests in their students while Barnard cares about their students. So, yeah. Great. Okay, and the final question I have for you is what advice would you have for a student who may not yet feel that she is clicking with her roommate or her hallway? or if she's having a difficult time finding a sense of community? Um, I mean, I would definitely say that your RA is your, your go-to gal for, for those issues. Um, be them, you know, like some kind of mediation that's necessary, um, which is kind of a more extreme case, and they do happen. Um, or if it's just like, I, like having a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation with your RA on how to kind of click with your roommate, how to, um, kind of form some kind of bond, even if your interests are, you know, polar opposites. Um, I also think that RAs, um, I mean, RAs do have um, a small budget that's given to them by residential life in order to have programming, and um, programming programs are designed to meet the interests of the residents. So um, if a resident if is feeling like her interests aren't being met on campus, or if her interests aren't being met on the floor, then um, the RA, if she does go to the RA and she says, look, I'm having a hard time, like I, I really love um, seeing movies, but nobody here ever has time to go see a movie. It's really frustrating. Or the RA, I mean, pro there are programs that are around movies and that builds community and that is one of the goals of, of residential life and housing. So I think that um, RAs are an incredible tool for um, forming like a like a common interest amongst the floor, and I think that's a great tool for residents. Um, I think it's really great to be able to talk with your roommates uh, and to be honest and say, hey, I really feel like um, I haven't sort of found my place here. I don't really know what to get involved in. Um, I don't really feel comfortable here yet. And even though your roommates may not have acknowledged that um, previously, they may feel the same way. And maybe you can go out and join a club together or join a sport or something like that. Um, I also want to piggyback off what Georgia said. And um, your RA is a great, great, so, um, is a great, great uh, resource person. Um, she may not have all the answers. She probably will not have all the answers for you, but she will know where you can go to get those answers. Um, 
there are um, ways to get involved both on the Barnard campus and on the Columbia campus. Um, I am president of the Russian International Association of Columbia University. Um, the way that I got involved with that was just by word of mouth. Um, as I went to my math help room every week, there was a, um, a girl there who was involved in the club and, and uh, told me about it. I was very interested. and. Um, uh, I got a position on the board, and today I'm president of the um, of the club. So uh, I really think that it's important to talk to others on campus and also um, talk to your RA. And and just lastly, um, nothing will ever come to somebody just by sitting in their room with their door closed. Nobody's going to knock on their door and say, oh my god, there's this great position opening up on some board. Like You should really run for it. It's not going to happen. You need to be involved. Um, in your community, just make an active effort. Um, I'd like to turn this to your experience in classes now and in a similar way. So you've just been uh, painting this great picture for us of what it was like for you as a first year student to experience the first couple of months on campus. So I'd love it if you could do the same thing for your first year foundation class. And I think that some of you took first year English first semester and some of you took first year seminar. So if you could share which class you took and then what it was like being a new student in that class during those first two months. So my first semester I took Women in Culture and I had a visiting professor from NYU whose name I can't remember. <clears throat> I remember um, being really nervous in class because in high school I went to a really small boarding school and all my classes had like six to seven students and it wasn't that many students in my classes. And then when I came to Barnard, like my first year English class had about like 13, 14 students, which is still a really small number, but for some reason I was really nervous. And I remember all the females in my class were really talkative and like they always had something to say and they all sounded so smart and I was just like, wow, like. I don't know what to say in class about Shakespeare's play. Like I was like always quiet and confused. So I remember um, I went to office hours one day to discuss my paper, and my professor she was telling me like, "Wow, like you're a really great writer, and I encourage you to like speak up in class." And I think like hearing it from her that like what I'm saying and my writing does make sense, and that I do sound intelligent as well, it made me like speak up in class. So from then on, like I really started to speak up in class. I started to participate um, a lot more. And another skill that I developed from my first year English class was the process of rewriting papers over and over. I remember in high school, like you would submit a copy, you would get feedback from your peers, and then you would revise it, and that would be it. Here at Barnard, um, the first year English classes, they focus on using the writing fellows. So I would write a paper, it would receive edits from my peers, and then I would have to take it to the writing fellows, and then my teacher would like write and mess it all up, and I would have to redo it again. <laughs> but um, at the end, like I was like an amazing writer, I felt like, and that's like a skill I kept throughout my um, years at Barnard. Like whenever I have a paper due, I don't start the night before. I start two weeks in advance. That way, I can go to the writing fellows, I can hand it into my teacher in advance, so she can revise it, and then I can hand in a masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, I took. Legacy of the Mediterranean as part of the in-residence seminar. Um, I really enjoyed the residential aspect of it because you knew uh, your classmates and you had really fulfilling outside discussions after class and stuff like that. Um, I also really enjoyed, even though I didn't really like the professor's teaching style in the classroom, I really enjoyed the fact that he was really available. And um, he had his office hours at the Hungarian pastry shop. So I could talk to my friends and, and put on my Facebook status that I'm actually having coffee with my professor every Thursday afternoons. That sounds really cool. Um, and, but um, it's definitely true um, that it can be really confusing about the participation aspect. Um, and coming from an actually really other extreme, uh, um, I was like going to really huge um, Korean high school and in Korea you don't really participate as much. So the two challenging aspects about participation was the first of all I was coming from a different educational background. I didn't have as much knowledge in Greek mythology. Um, I barely knew who Homer was. Um, the second aspect basically was getting feedback from your professor immediately in front of a all the other students can be really intimidating because I've been always used to like getting feedback on my paper, like written feedback, or just like one-to-one -one conversations, but just raising your hand, telling some, asking something, or making a comment, and have the professor saying, well, I don't think I agree with that. 
or how would you approach this was really intimidating for me. Uh, that was quite a shock. But the conclusion is that even though the experience might not be pleasant, it is definitely exciting to have your ideas challenged. And as, as I went through the semester, I was really eager to go to that class, make a comment my professor would agree on. So it really became a challenge for myself, and I think it was thrilling. So when I was a first year, I took a first year seminar called Women in Culture. Uh, this class for me was very challenging and also very frustrating. When I was in high school, I was an amazing writer, and I knew it. Um, uh, I knew how to write my outline very quickly, stick to it, write my essay, and get a good grade. But when I came to college, <coughs> All of a sudden, my professors weren't really appreciating that. Um, <laughs> they weren't looking for generalizations. They were looking for insight. Uh, and uh, I wasn't comfortable with that. So over time, I had to learn that writing papers for my class was sort of like having a conversation with myself and constantly sort of um, battling it out. Well, maybe the, maybe the characters were feeling this way, uh, or maybe they were feeling this way because of, for this reason or for another reason. Um, and um, uh, sorry, so um, I found that what was helpful for me was to go to the professor's office hours and talk to them about it, and they appreciated that um, because sometimes it takes more. Um, it takes more strength to admit that you don't understand something than to just uh, keep it to yourself. Um, over time, I did improve in my, in my writing, but I think what was even more important was that the skills that I learned in those classes, I apply today, not just to um, sort of humanities uh, courses that I take, but other courses as well, where I have to pay attention to details and um, avoid taking the easy way out um, of summarizing and generalizing, because professors are looking for something just a little bit more um, insightful. Um, I, like Boyan, I was also um, in an in-residence seminar, um, so half, the f half of my uh, freshman floor was um, in class with me uh, twice a week, and um, I was in a seminar called The Art of Being Oneself, um, perhaps, perhaps a little you know, self-indulgent, but um, uh, it was about the art of a personal essay. Um, I really actually loved the reading list, um, but I found it very challenging to come to class every twice a week prepared to discuss on an analytical, like in a very analytical way, um, in a very critical way. So I think that was a huge challenge for me. I came from a large public high school where it was classrooms of 30 kids and all we had to do was read something, read something that was about three pages at home, come to class, answer a few questions like on a piece of paper and hand it in. And that was the limit to our like analyzing a text. Um, so I found that hugely challenging, but, um, and also like uh, that, I mean, it was very difficult for me to speak up in class because um, I wasn't sure if I was right about, you know, what Benjamin was trying to say or, um, and I felt like, of course, that everyone else in the room was um, so much more intelligent than I was and if I spoke, everyone would just shut me down. Um, so that was a very big challenge to kind of get over. Um, at the and it, it, it slowly became um, easier, both because I, you know, everyone in my class, um, I became friends with um, them, but then by the end, I actually had to make them a 30-minute presentation um, about a personal essay, and um, that, the, the idea of speaking for 30 minutes <laughs> to my peers was, I was like, there's no way that's happening. Um, so uh, I remember spending hours and hours, like, reading this text over and over again, trying to think of something insightful to say. And um, I ultimately like just went in there and just did it. It was like 45 minutes long, led a discussion. Um, ended up being a hugely, um, it definitely boosted my confidence as far in that manner, um, in that regard. So I also found it challenging getting very, getting, you know, not so, I didn't get A's on my papers the first time around anymore. Um, that was a huge challenge, but I think that by getting, you know, B's and learning that, you know, you actually have to be a little bit more insightful, you have to question yourself as you're writing, you have to revise, 
Um, the, and I also learned about the precision of language and like not, you know, as you're writing, it's not just like the first thing that pops into your head. The first way to formulate a sentence is not necessarily the most um, adequate way to kind of um, communicate what you're saying and that if you go back and you kind of figure out exactly what you're trying to say, what words are really, you know, really get to the heart of what you're saying. Um, that's something that has seeped into every aspect of my studies. So first semester, full of challenges and frustrations, as well as some interesting ideas along the way. So second semester, was it all easy as pie? You had it all figured out? Or how would you describe going into a similar kind of class second semester? Um, was it a continuation? Was it similar? Were there differences? <clears throat> so for me, I thought that my second um, semester was harder. I had first year seminar, um, narcissism and morality. And it was a class that was really heavy in biology texts, um, psychology texts, Freudian psychoanalysis. It was just, I was just like, why am I reading this stuff as a first year in college? It was like really intense. And often I found myself confused. I remember one time I had to write a fiction paper, and that's not common. Um, and I was like, well, it should be easy though. Like, it's like writing a cartoon, like, it's gonna be really easy. And when I got my paper back, I didn't do so well. And my teacher actually told me, like, I was writing as if I was in high school. And <laughs> that was, like, really hard to swallow because I did really well in my first year English class. But um, again, through going to office hours, making revisions, I improved my writing. And, like, now I feel comfortable with writing fiction in, as well as, like, analytical papers. Um, so when I was um, in my second semester, I didn't really find that things were getting easier for me. I was taking um, first year English, Legacy of the Mediterranean. I was still having some of those same challenges and frustrations that I was having my first semester. Even though my professor did have a little bit of a different approach in assignments and, and readings and things like that. Uh, although at the time I didn't realize it, looking back, I made significant improvements. Um, it's just that they weren't easy for me to see at that point. But now I realize that um, my writing really did improve and it was, it was a very worthwhile experience and course class. Um, I took the second sequence of Legacy of the Mediterranean um, as my English class. And I think the difference between the two is that for seminar, it's a class designed to discover new ideas. And for English, it's basically when you start framing your own ideas. So it was really more writing intense. And um, basically, your essays had to be more meticulous and, and more framed. So it was definitely hard to narrow down really, really big ideas and make it their, your own. Because in high school, I think you really get the guidance of like a specific path you have to take for the writing, for your essays. And there is more or less right and wrong answers. Here, how can you have a right approach to Homer? How can you have a right approach to Canterbury Tales? Like there's so many interpretations you can have. You really basically what the professors are expecting is a lot of thinking and a lot of work in like your writing style itself. So I think it was really really enlightening to see that there can be many right answers and you just have to find your own. Um, I think I also had um, pretty large challenges in my second semester as well. Um, I, my first year seminar professor, um, I ended up becoming really great friends with her. I call her Mindy. We have coffee together, like to this day, four years later, three years later. Um, so, but, and then I got to my first year English professor, and it was a very different, it was a challenge because he was a little, very different teaching style, um, and I didn't exactly know how to handle um, the way he conducted class. Um, but nevertheless, obviously, I learned, I mean, the whole point of um, first year English is kind of like this emphasis on revision, on rewriting, on questioning yourself. Um, and that, I mean, I definitely learned about that. Um, and I learned also that um, it's okay to kind of question the ideas that people are putting out um, to kind of, you know, say, well, I, I, I'm not sure I agree with you on that point. I actually think this. Um, but I think what's more, most important about um, that, that new um, 
comfort level with kind of questioning other people is also the ability to back you, yourself up, to kind of, um, like you can jump to point from point A to point B, but you have to also be able to fill in the blanks and say, well, this is how I came across this um, conclusion. So I think that's obviously a very important um, skill that, that I feel I learned in, the, in first year English, despite my kind of um, difficult experience with the professor. Um, I also learned that, um, like everyone's been saying, that rewriting papers like is key. It is the way to write papers in college. It's there's no there's turning in first draft has um, that's not something that can happen anymore. You have to be able to go back and question yourself, question how you phrased this one idea, question um, how you've organized the paper. Um, it's it's like a, an additive and a subtractive process, um, and like. In, I mean, the, I mean, at the core of first year English is this idea of rewriting, and that's definitely something that I learned. So, when you are talking to first year students, whether they be um, residents in your hallways or just uh, new students that you meet, and, and talking to them from your perspective as an upper class student, and they say, "I'm so." frustrated with my course, I'm not quite sure what to do to get beyond this B that I got on this paper. What is, what is one big piece of advice that you would give a student um, who's trying to figure out what's expected of her in these first year classes? I think my biggest piece of advice is to go to often sours. Often you assume that like because we speak English, we should be able to write in English, that writing a paper is easy. But that's not always the case. Um, utilize office hours as much as possible. I remember like just last semester, I was taking a class, Black Theater, with Professor Pam Colburn, who's an amazing professor. She's also the head of the writing fellows. So all my friends are like, are you sure you're gonna take a four credit class with her? Like, she's a hard grader, like it's gonna be hard, you're not gonna get an A in that class. And I was just like, okay, like I'm gonna still take it. And I tried. And I went to office hours all the time. Like, she knew my name, she knew where I was from, she knew so much about me. Because every single week I was in her office hours revising my papers, and I earned that A. So definitely use office hours. I would probably tell uh, my residents that it's okay to feel frustrated. You're learning something very new. And as I like to think for myself, and as I like to think for myself back then, if I already knew everything, why would I be here? Why would I be in college? The point is to be challenged. And um, the other thing that I think is very important is to talk to uh, either your roommates, other people on your hall, just other Barnard students about how they're feeling. because. Um, today I'm actually uh, best friends with somebody who was on uh, my hall in another triple. And just, um, just this year she told me that, you know, when we were in first year seminar together, you sounded so smart and I just thought everything you said was so deep and so insightful and I just, I didn't know how you were, how you were saying all these things. And, but when I was in first year seminar, I felt like everybody else was smarter than me. So. It, People, I feel like um, if people just acknowledged these feelings that they have, uh, you know, everybody would just feel so much more at ease and comfortable. So that's very important. Yeah, getting, I mean, getting, you know, not getting A's anymore is very frustrating. Um, a, a huge shock, huge shock to me, huge shock to most of my friends. Um, but in that, in that getting, you know, perhaps B's, even C's on papers, um, and realizing that you can go back and revise, it can be a hugely, um, I mean, you learn a lot. Um, and I mean, when, when I was getting B's, I was like, well, clearly I'm just an awful student and there's just no hope. But um, once I kind of got in my head that like, this is actually like a learning process, um, and that it's not, it's not, a grade is not um, assigning you to how intelligent you are. Um, it's not like a numerical value to like, like how you compare to the rest of um, the Barnard class. It's actually a way to point you to a more critical and analytical way of thinking and comprehending a text. Um, and I, I think that um, it would be really boring if everyone just got A's in college and that would mean that you came to college to pretty much stay the same, so. Yeah, along the same lines. I think you have learning where your limits are is the first step to go beyond your limits. And I think first year seminar, first year English, there are classes that teach you that you're actually thinking in a box and that you should think out of the box and they guide you through that process. Mm -hmm. oh. So any last words of wisdom? We're running a little long, so just any last 
uh, pieces of advice that you would give a first-year student generally, especially at this point in the semester? Um, I would say to savor it as a senior who, um, like when we had a conversation about in preparation for this, I was, I was, I walked out and was very like nostalgic and really, really missed my first year um, because it is a very unique time in, in, in college and in life because it's, I mean, this, it's just this uh, concentration of individuals who are going through the exact same experience, well, uh, largely the same experiences. Um, and there's kind of this like commiseration and celebration that happens in this concentrated area. Um, and I really think that savoring your first year and realizing that like, it's not something you have to get through, it's something that you should enjoy, that, that would be my advice. My advice would be don't focus on your grades so much. It's only your first year, your first semester, and there's always room for improvement. I know like a lot of my residents are pre-med, and they're always stressing, like, I didn't get an A on my first exam. And I tell them, if you get an A in bio this semester, you have to get an A next semester, too. Leave room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my advice would be circling back to the Columbia Barnard relationship. Um, just want to, you know, uh, give the advice that those comments or those attitudes come from very immature um, Columbia students, and really they're making the number one fallacy that you should never make in your social life or academic life over generalizations. So just let's work hard to like prove them wrong. <laughs> Just very quickly, um, I can say without a doubt that for me and perhaps for other people, your first year is the most difficult year that you'll have here at Barnard, and it's so much easier to say that uh, looking back. Um, and the the different kinds of experiences that you're exposed to here at Barnard in terms of interacting with just uh, diverse uh, groups, with diverse populations, um, with very very. Um, uh, uh, with a very, very challenging course load and things like that. Um, when you're in this like small Barnard community, you may not understand the great intellectual leap that you're making. But once you go outside of the Barnard gates, um, as you travel, um, you know, just anywhere else, you realize how much Barn um, you will realize how much Barnard has changed you and how much um, how much you've grown from it. Um, and I think that that's very important. Um, well, we, we run a little bit long, so I'm sorry we don't have time for general questions, but I think we'll be happy to sort of linger if any of you have specific questions for any of our RAs or for Steve Tolman or for me. Um, but I hope that this has given you a little bit of a more insight into the first year experience. Thanks very much for coming.